Joshua chapter 20. And we'll be looking at the first three verses. But uh, I want to remind you about my thoughts on the Old Testament. Uh, New Testament says that those things that, that were written aforetime were written for our learning. I believe throughout uh, the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, throughout the entire Bible, uh, we see Jesus in every uh, book of the Bible. But there are those, you know, that gave me uh, advice years ago, or just threw this out. I figured since they were talking to me, I figured they was gearing this toward me. You know, we need to get out of the old Bible and stay in the new Bible. And what I, what I took from that was they were meaning uh, Marty stay out of the Old Testament, dwell in the New Testament. But again, everything that uh, in the Bible is geared toward Jesus Christ. I want to remind you about those fellas that was uh, walking down the road to Emmaus. And... Uh, after Jesus uh, left them, uh, they talked about being filled with the uh, Spirit as he expounded unto them all the Scriptures, uh, them and all the Scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, reckon what Scriptures he was expounding out of. It wasn't Revelation. The only scriptures they had at the time were the Old Testament. So he expounded to them, those two guys on the road to Emmaus, uh, the things from the scripture, from the Old Testament concerning himself. And as a matter of fact, uh, John 5, 39, he says, search the scriptures. Well, at the time he's saying that, what scriptures? The Old Testament. Search the scriptures, for in them do you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So all scripture points to Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, uh, I'm mistakenly, y'all have heard me from time to time say, talk about the four gospels. Literally, there's 66 of them, because all scripture points to Christ, and this morning we're going to find Jesus in Joshua chapter 20. You say, by name? No, we're not going to find his name, but we're, it's going to be pointing to Jesus Christ. If you look with me in Joshua chapter 20, starting in verse 1, the Lord also spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge. Whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. So right there in uh, verse 2, he says, I'm, I'm reminding you that... Uh, to set up those cities that I spoke to Moses about, that Moses spoke to you about, wrote to you about, to set up those cities of refuge that I spoke to him about. And uh, one writer says uh, this avenger of blood would, could be a close relative that was out to seek out the person who had done the killing. Murder. And, their job, and his job was to put that murderer to death. It was only the cold-blooded murderer. Folks, some folks died at the hands of others, and it was by accident. And that's what these cities of refuge are for. It wasn't for the cold-blooded murderer. I'm going to go out and I'm going to kill somebody. No, it was those that were killed by accident, the ones that caused that accident could go to this city of refuge and be safe. The avenger of blood might, was out to get them, but as long as they was in that city of refuge, they was okay. As long as we in Jesus Christ 
we're okay. He is our city of refuge. If you look over with me to Hebrews chapter 6, and you, you can stick something over there, your hand or something over there, maybe a piece of paper over there, because we're going to be coming back to Hebrews several times this morning. But Hebrews chapter number 6, verse number 18. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 18. Now, you want to know where the Bible says God can't lie? Uh, we're right there. Hebrews 6, 18. That by two immutable things in which it, it was impossible for God to lie. And uh, you've heard me say this before, and maybe you're still dwelling upon it, what I've said before. If God was to lie, the truth would be changed. Because God can't lie. So... It's just a refresher. If you hadn't been thinking about that in a while, there you go. Uh, reflect upon that. If Even if God lied, the truth would be changed. But the truth ain't going to change, and God ain't going to lie. So it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay, upon, to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Who's our refuge? None other than Jesus Christ. You say, well, how does this apply to me? I ain't killed nobody. Good. You hadn't stalked down anybody and shot them, knifed them, or lumbered them upside the head. That's great. Rocked them upside the head. That's great. I don't reckon I've done that either. Either on purpose or by accident, thankfully. But I stand before you this morning guilty of murder. And if you want to be honest about it, you are too. Who put Jesus on the cross? Somebody might say, well, I don't know his name, but that guy that hammered those nails, he's the one that put him on the cross. Maybe. But my sin, my sins are what put him there. I'm guilty of murder. And I need a place of refuge. You need a place of refuge. The world needs a place of refuge. You remember one of the things that Jesus said on the cross, we find it in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So you, I was born, and uh, I just sinned because I didn't know no better. For all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then one day I realized, hey, uh, some of these things I've been doing is wrong. I need forgiveness. And that forgiveness only comes in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I hope you held your place over in Hebrews. Let's turn over to Hebrews uh, chapter 10, starting in verse 26. We'll, we'll skip over verse 25 today, if that's all right. Forsake it not to assemble yourselves together, that, that verse. We'll go on down to verse 26. There's some today that uh, just outright just refuse. We've, we've been talking about this type of person lately, but there's a type of person that just refuses. Yonder's the light. Well, I, I ain't going over there. And Jesus says in John chapter 3 about those folks, that they, they don't want to come to the light lest their deeds be shown to be evil. But those of us who are in the light, we want more light that our deeds may be made manifest. Look at verse 26 through verse 30, Hebrews chapter 10. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. But a certain 
Fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation, which devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot of the Son of God, hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. And I come back to that sight on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. If you turn back with me to Joshua chapter 20, so he, God reminded Joshua these cities of refuge need to be set up. And if you look down to verse 7 and 8, and I'm on, I, I imagine, do a fly, fine job of slaughtering some names this morning, but uh, it's not intentional. Uh, believe me, I'm doing the best that I can do. Uh, Seemed like I used to pronounce stuff better years ago. But anyway, Joshua 20, verse number 7. Here are the six cities that they set up. They appointed Kadesh in Galilee in Mount Naphtali, Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and Kareth Arba, Kerjath Arba, which is in Hebron, which is Hebron, in the Mount of Judah. And on the other side of Jordan, because you know some, some came across Jordan, but some said, uh, we don't want that. We want our allotment over here on this side. So they had to set up some cities over there. And on the other side of Jordan by Jericho eastward, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness upon the plain out of the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth and Gilead out of the tribe of Gad, and Golan, Golan in Bashan out of the tribe of Manasseh. So those are the six cities they set up. And as you've heard me multiple times, like, kind of like uh, Methuselah, his name, it means something. These cities were named, their names have a meaning. Each one of those mean, meanings point to one person, and that's Jesus Christ. Let's look at the first one in verse 7. First one is Kadesh. Kadesh simply means a place of holiness. You and I who are saved realize this, that Jesus is the only reason we could be considered holy. If you look over with me to Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse number 14, it gives us the following picture. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. We need Jesus Christ. He is our holiness. He is our righteousness. And had it not been for Jesus Christ, there would be no holiness in Marty Moses' life. Because he is my holiness. If you look back to Joshua 20, verse number 7, the second city there was found in Mount Ephraim, and uh, it city of refuge there was called Shechem. You say, what in the world does Shechem mean? Just simple shoulder. You say, well, how in the world does that point to Christ? Well, I want to remind you about something. What happened in the parable of the lost sheep when that sheep went astray? You say, well, the shepherd went and got it. And I say, amen. How did the shepherd bring it back? He put it on his shoulders. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, the government shall be on his shoulder. 
He carries us. Now, I've shared with you the revival service I went to, and uh, the only thing that was, uh, was there that night, I brought my Bible. I had just surrendered to preach and uh, brought my Bible, wanting to get fed, didn't need my Bible. Wonderful story told that evening. Some of you got it hanging on your walls. Some of, most of us have seen it. It was about the footprints. No, that was about the starfish. But him throwing the starfish in the, the sand, uh, into the ocean, and said, well, you can't make, possibly make a difference about all these. He said, well, I'm going to make a difference for this one. He chucked another one in there, and we dismissed and went home. That's the story of the starfish, but footprints in the sand. Another wonderful story. And not having it before me, just telling you what I can remember of it. The writer said, why? There's two sets, sets of footprints. Why on this part in my life is there just one? And the Lord said, that's when I was carrying you. Oh, he's got some powerful shoulders. That when we are weak, that he carries us. One writer says, uh, this tells us of Christ not only is our Savior who gives us holiness, but also is our strength. He carries us along, bears us along. When we're feeling weak, he's there to uphold us. When we feel that we can't live the Christian life, well, has God ever asked us to live the Christian life? Because apart from him, we can't. So he's there to uphold us. If you look back to Joshua 20, verse number 7, the third city is Hebron, Hebron. And here's what Hebron means. Hebron was a place where the milk and honey flowed in the promised land. Hebron is a luscious, glorious, beautiful mountain it was a city of refuge, and here's what it means. Fellowship and fullness. Fellowship and fullness. 1 John 1 verse 3 says, tells us where as a child of God, our fellowship needs to belong, where it needs to abide in. And here's what it says. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Don't feel sorry for me because I'm a Christian. Because I have wonderful fellowship with Jesus Christ. Verse 8 of Joshua 20 tells us the next three. And the first one is uh, what I'm pronouncing Be Bezer. It was in the wilderness playing out of the tribe of Reuben. And you say, what in the world does it mean? Fortification. Fortification. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. He is our fortress, our fortification. The next city listed in verse 8 is Ramoth in Gilead out of the tribe of Gad. You say, well, what does Ramoth mean? Exalted. Exalted. Where is Jesus today? Well, he's seated next to our Heavenly Father on his throne. If you look over with me to Acts 2 and verse 33. Acts 2 and verse number 33. Verse 32 says, as you turn there, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. And in verse number 33, it says, Therefore being uh, uh, by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which you now see and you now hear. Amen, the Holy Ghost had done showed up. And then finally, Joshua 20 and verse 8, the last one, 
Golan in Bashan out of the tribe of Manasseh was the sixth city. It means simply separated, sanctified, if you will. If you look over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 17, it says there, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. He is our sanctification. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Why six cities? Why not just one? Why not just one big one where they could all make it to? Well, I'm going to say this. If we had accidentally took someone's life, wouldn't you want a city of refuge to be pretty close? That's why there were six. They were positioned in such a way that wherever you were, there was always a city of refuge close by. Psalm 145 and verse 18 says this, The Lord is nigh. The Lord is near unto all that call upon his name. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Starting in verse number 6. Romans 10 and verse number 6. I'm, I'm wearing just an out back there this morning, I know. Romans 10 and verse number 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Now, where does the righteousness come from? Comes from only comes from the Lord. And it's by faith. It says this. Say not in thine heart who shall send into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? Where's the word at? The word is nigh thee. And if you don't like, I don't usually use the word nigh. Because, uh, you know, going on vacation, are we there yet? We're nigh. No, I didn't ever. We're getting close. We get, we're near it. But nigh, it wasn't. No. Bridget, y'all ever use that? Are we nigh? Daddy, are we nigh? The, yeah, you he didn't, he didn't ever say that. Well, we didn't ever do that either. But the word is nigh thee. It's near thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, which is the word of faith that we preached, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, Shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And again, I want to remind you about what Psalm 145 and verse 18 says. The Lord is nigh them, near them, that call upon his name. I'm thankful for that. I believe it was last week we talked about that he must needs go through Samaria because there was a lady there he needed to talk to. Needed to have dealings with. And I told you that I was glad that he came through Grassy, Alabama 40-something years ago. 42 years ago now. Because he had to deal with me. I needed to be saved. I'm glad that refuge is near. I don't have to go off over yonder somewhere to try to find him. He's near. Verse 13 of Romans 10 says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord's near them, the Lord's nigh them that call on his name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And uh, let me say this. I assure you our turning is almost over. But would you turn with me, please, to 2 Samuel chapter 3. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse number 32. 2 Samuel chapter 3, and verse number 32. It says in my Bible, they buried Abner in Hebron. And I hope the word Hebron, based upon what we talked about this morning, I hope that's familiar to you. They buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. Let's go ahead and read verse 33 while we're here. You say, why am I much weeping? Well, he's lost somebody. That's one reason. Verse 33 tells us the rest of it. And the king lamented over Abner and said, died Abner as a fool dieth. Let's talk a little bit about Abner. We're not going to read his whole story. But Abner was a pretty good-sized feller. And he had this feller uh, by the name of, he was a friend of King David. He was a friend of a man named Joab, who was David's co commander-in-chief. And Joab had a brother named Azahel. And Azahel thought it was going to be his job to do away with Abner. And Abner didn't have, want to have nothing to do with this Fight that Ahazahel was uh, Ahazahel was uh, conjuring up. So Abner began running away from Ahazahel, saying to him, "Leave me alone! Go back! Leave me alone!" But he wouldn't hear of it, and Abner killed him by accident. Didn't set out to murder him. But in self-defense, Ahazahel was killed. You remember what we read in Joshua 20? What could happen? Well, the avenger of death, avenger of blood, could run him down. But if he made it to a city of refuge, he was going to be safe. So after Ahazahel died, Abner was headed to Hebron, the city of refuge, and got up right up to the gate. And Joab said, come here, I need to talk to you. And he stopped, did not enter the gate, and stopped. And I believe it was under the fifth rib that he got him and killed him. Feet from refuge. Judas Iscariot kissed the very door to heaven, but didn't make an end. Abner was feet away from safety. But stopped short of entering into the refuge. There was a young man in Pennsylvania back in the 1800s. Uh, governor James Pollock was governor. This young man had committed murder. And as we know, it's the governor has the power to lay aside a sentence, they can forgive, they can commute a sentence, uh, and apparently back at this time, they could change a sentence. And some of this young man's friends got to talking to the governor and saying, uh, 
Why don't you just change his sentence to a life sentence? He'll, he'll die in prison, but he won't have to be hung. Would you do that? And it's written that, uh, that Governor Pollock said this. No. Or excuse me, he from Pennsylvania. No. I cannot do this. The sentence is just and right, and he must be hanged. Well, then the boy's mama got involved. She kept trying to see the governor. And the uh, governor didn't want to see her. And finally, one day, that mother showed up at the governor's office. And here's what she did. She fell flat on her face and began to crawl on her hands and knees across the floor. And she got to the governor, got him around the legs, and she began to weep and cry and said, Governor, please, please let my son live. And the governor said, I'm going to talk to him. Governor Pollock was a Christian. He wanted to know about this young man's soul's condition. So he went to the prison. He had the guard to unlock the door. He went in and sat down with this murderer. The young man was seated in the corner, had his face in his hands, wouldn't look up. The governor asked, young man, do you read the Bible? Nothing. Young man, do you know about Jesus? And the boy didn't answer. Young man, do you know that your mother loves you? And is praying for you. And the boy still just sat there. Not a word. So the governor got up and walked out. He asked the guard to unlock the door. He, he did. Closed the door. Locked it. And the young man heard these words. Thank you for coming, governor. And the young man looked up and he said, That was the governor? That was the governor? Yeah, that, that was Governor Pollock. You mean the man in my cell was the governor? He had the power to pardon me. And I wouldn't talk to him. He was right here, feet from the inches from me, and I would not talk to him. The only man on earth that could pardon him. And he said not a word. And it's written about this young man. That as they placed the noose around his neck. And dropped that hood over his head. His last words were this. If I'd only known. That he was in my cell. And I wouldn't even talk to him. So near, so close. Isaiah 1 and 18, if you'll look over there with me. Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And Justin, I promise you, one, one more place. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 26. As you turn in there, I want to let you know, the Lord's near. Isaiah 55 says, Seek you the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. Matthew 16, verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose? 
his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It may be this, it may be that that we're interested in. But one of the things that we need to consider, how's our soul this morning? How is our soul? Abner died. As David put it, just like a fool. Ancient. From refuge. This young man in Pennsylvania back in the 1800s had the only person in the state of Pennsylvania that could have pardoned him. He wouldn't talk to him. And as Jesus knocks on a person's heart, how foolish that is to turn him away. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much today for you being our place of refuge, our strong tower that we can run to, that we can turn to, and we can be safe. And Lord, if there's any listening to me today that hadn't found the refuge that's only found in you, Lord, give them the faith to answer the knock. Give them the faith to be saved. Provide it, Lord. And may we be a people, a saved people that call upon your name. And Lord, have your own way in each one of our lives. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand this morning as... Uh,